Okay. So let's start. So last time we did the compactness theorem. Today we'll uh, we'll do something known as uh, a maximal consistency. But uh, let's briefly go through the uh, compactness theorem. So essentially, what we are saying is that um, uh, if you take uh, uh, so you the compactness theorem essentially says that you take any countably infinite set of propositions, it is satisfiable uh, if all its non-empty finite subsets are satisfiable. And we went through this proof. And um, uh, a simple corollary uh, is that uh, any finite or infinite set of formulae is satisfiable if and only if it, all its non-empty finite subsets are satisfiable. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so the proof of the compactness theorem is uh, something that uh, we, uh, we actually proved it using the tableau itself. We essentially created Hintika sets. Uh, and we use Koenig's lemma. There are other proofs of the compactness theorem which do not require the use of tableau rules, which can be, uh, which can be proved from other things. There are also uh, proofs of the compactness theorem uh, which um, do not require the use of Koenig's lemma and Hintika sets, but let's, uh, for, for the moment, let's stay with this. Uh, so, and um, so com the compactness property is so important that uh, you know it's always good to have many different kinds of proofs as sort of validation that uh, uh, validation that your statement is uh, actually correct. Yeah. So one consequence of the compactness theorem is uh, that of inconsistency, and that is that uh, we define consistency of a set of formulae as essentially that all the formulae should be simultaneously satisfiable. Um, and so in essence, it is the same as satisfiability of a set of formulae. Now in view of the compactness theorem uh, and its corollary, actually more importantly its corollary is that I can, I can negate both the hypothesis and conclusion of this corollary and uh, essentially state that uh, a set is inconsistent a set gamma is inconsistent if and only if at least one non-empty finite subset of it is inconsistent or unsatisfiable. So inconsistency is the same as unsatisfiability or rather it's the same as uh, simultaneous, uh, the negation of simultaneous satisfiability. So, so the other thing of course is uh, that uh, therefore uh, just like um, a subset of a consistent set is always consistent. A superset of an inconsistent set is, of course, always inconsistent. And uh, in particular, if you go through the tableau methods and so on and so forth, any set containing a complementary pair is inconsistent. Um, and uh, through the tableau methods, if for any formula phi, uh, if you have both the of phi of the form psi uh, multiplicative operator chi, then if you have both psi prime and chi prime uh, in your set of formulae, then that set is inconsistent. Um, and um, in the case of an additive operator, if you have, if both the sets, con uh, two sets which are identical except that one of them contains psi prime and the other contains chi prime, if both of them are inconsistent, then the original set containing phi is also inconsistent. So this is what we did about inconsistency and the other, so what it means now is if you want to, given any finite or infinite sub, uh, set of formulae and some formula of psi, you uh, gamma union naught psi is inconsistent if and only if there exists a finite subset of gamma such that, uh, let us call that delta, such that delta union naught psi is inconsistent, yeah. And um, similarly, all these things. So what it means is that to show that an argument is valid, uh, it suffices to prove that uh, if I negate the conclusion, I, it suffices to prove that some subset of the hypothesis along with the negation of the conclusion is unsatisfiable. Yeah, okay. So now the next, the next question one can ask 
for sets of formulae is that of consistency. We can extend consistency the other way instead of going downwards to finite subsets. We can think of a take a set of formulae gamma and see how what elements one can add to it, all right. So, one thing is that if gamma is a consistent set, then you can add for any formula phi, you can add either its either phi itself or its negation and still maintain consistency, right. And that is actually uh, fairly to easy to see uh, using a proof by contradiction. Uh, if gamma is consistent, but uh, let, let us say the addition of uh, the addition of the formula phi gives you I am sorry right. So, gamma 1 contains gamma union phi and gamma naught contains gamma union naught phi. If, uh, if both of them are inconsistent, then it is clear that there must be some finite subset subsets of gamma 1 and gamma naught. So, let us call them delta 1 and delta naught respectively, okay. Where delta 1 contains phi, delta naught contains naught phi and if you remove phi and naught phi, then the, uh, then the delta, uh, I mean uh, if you, you can, uh, uh, no, you can take, since, since gamma is consistent, you can take finite subsets gamma naught and gamma 1, okay, add naught phi and phi respectively and they sh if gamma naught and gamma 1 are both inconsistent, then this corresponding gamma naught prime which is delta naught union naught phi and uh, gamma 1 prime which is delta 1 union phi will both be inconsistent, right. Whereas, delta naught and delta 1 themselves which are just sub finite subsets of gamma will be consistent because gamma is assumed to be consistent, right. So, if gamma naught and gamma 1 are inconsistent, then there exist finite subsets delta naught and delta 1 of uh, gamma such that delta naught union naught phi and delta 1 union phi are both inconsistent. Let us call them gamma naught prime and gamma 1 prime. So, if now consider delta naught 1 to be the union of delta naught and delta 1. Since delta naught and delta 1 are both consistent subsets of gamma and they are both finite, delta naught 1 which is the union of these two sets is also, I should be, we find it easier to check that, okay. Uh, then delta 0 1 uh, is also consistent because it is a finite, it is a, it's a union of two finite sets. Uh, two finite consistent sets and then what happens is that both delta 0 1 union naught phi and delta 0 1 union phi are inconsistent and hence unsatisfiable. If that is so, then there is a truth assignment tau which satisfies every formula in delta 0 1 and such that for both phi and naught phi it gives me 0 which is impossible. So, there is a simple proof by contradiction to show that given any consistent set, I can add for any formula phi either the phi itself or the formula naught phi and still maintain consistency. Now, we can extend this further to how how many such different formulae can you add, okay. So, before that let us look at, uh, let us look at uh, something known as a property of finite character, yeah. So, um, and in particular this is important because compactness is actually one of the, is an example of a property of finite character, right. So, uh, a property P of sets, uh, this by the way this has got nothing to do with really logic, it is just general set theoretic mathematics, yeah. So, you take any property P of sets, it is called a property of finite character, if for any set S, S has the property P if and only if every finite subset of S also has the property P. So, 
compactness or the corollary to the compactness theorem essentially tells you that compactness is a property of finite character. There are, so we will use this notation to denote that S has property P, right. But there are actually properties of finite character are always useful. In fact, they are always useful to characterize various kinds of infinitary properties. Uh, so for example, you take, uh, so here are some simple examples. You take the property of being uh, of a partially ordered set being totally ordered. So essentially a, a, a set P under some less than or equal to relation is partially ordered, then um, it is totally ordered if and only if every finite subset of P is also totally ordered, okay. And uh, so that is, so the property of being totally ordered for partial orders for the universe of partially ordered sets is a property of finite character, okay. Here uh, on the other hand there are properties like being well ordered. Uh, what is well ordering? I mean that is that you do not have any infinite descending chain. So you take any totally ordered set, uh, every finite subset of it is well ordered in the sense that taken given any finite subset, a totally uh, you cannot find a de an infinite descending chain since this you have taken a finite subset. But the whole set itself may not be well ordered under that less than or equal to relation. So well orderings of total orders, so in the universe of totally ordered sets, the property of being well ordered is not a property of finite character, okay. So whereas compactness is a property of finite character, there are actually other properties of finite character which you may have encountered in uh, other, other parts of mathematics like for example. Um, the question of k colorability, whether a graph uh, is k colorable, okay. So in particular, we take the question of infinite graphs being k colorable. That means uh, you 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 have a you have let's say an undirect an infinite undirected graph. So its vertex set is infinite, and the edge set also uh, is infinite. Uh, and they are all undirected edges and what you are saying is you have a set of k colors and no two, uh, no, two, no two vertices which are connected by an edge should bear the same color. Is it possible to color the graph? I mean this is the map coloring problem or the graph coloring problem, right? Take, take into infinite sets. So it is possible to show that an infinite graph is k colorable if and only if every finite subgraph is also k colorable, right. And so k colorability for example is a property of finite character. There and other for uh, the, the question of uh, if you look at uh, I mean uh, an, an almost exact analogy to k colorability is that of tiling, right. I mean you have uh, you, ha you have you have a set, a set of tiles of some, some sizes, let us say rectangular tiles or some such thing or hexagonal tiles whatever and uh, you want to tile the entire plane so that tiles do not overlap, edges are maintained uh, and uh, this question of whether, uh, whether that an infinite plane can be tiled with a given set of tiles is equivalent to the question it, it, that is possible if and only if every finite subplane is also tileable with those tiles, with only those tiles, right. So that is so tileability and actually the, the problem of tileability can be uh, mapped onto the problem of k colorability also. So properties of finite character are important in mathematics in general and uh, compactness is one example of a property of finite character, yeah. And we will look at this property of finite character, uh, we will look at this to, so if you were to take properties of finite character in their most general form, then there is an interesting uh, lemma by Tukey, which says that given any set, you take a denumerable universe and any property P of finite character, then any set 
which satisfies this property P, which has this property P, can be extended to a maximal set which continues to have this property. So what we saw previously was that of consistency, right? If gamma is a consistent set, then can you add more and more elements? So one question that you can ask is how many different elements from the set of all propositions, P0? So the universe now is the set P0 of all possible propositions. Can I add to gamma to keep it consistent? Okay, which means if it is if it is maximally if if I have a maximally consistent set, then adding any more formula into it will make it inconsistent. Okay, so that's what I mean by a maximally consistent set. So, um, but uh, so let's let's first look at this uh, proof of Tukey's lemma. So it essentially says that any given a property P of finite character for sets, uh, subsets of an denumerable universe U, any set S which has the property P can be extended to a maximal set which has this property P, okay? Right, so the, the proof is important because of the fact that many things in computer science also follow similar, in the semantics of programming languages, uh, follow a similar uh, approach. So what, what I can do is I can since, uh, so I have a denumerable universe U and so which means that it's U elements. So, uh, so all the elements of U can be enumerated in some order, let's say A1, A2, A3. So I'm using only the positive integers, I'm not using zero. So assume that there is a set, uh, set S, a subset of this universe, uh, which has the property P, right? Uh, now I call that set S, S0. And then what do I do is I extend that set gradually. So my SI plus one uh, for any I is uh, consists of, okay, so this, so this A here should actually be A I plus one, yeah, for I greater than or equal to zero. So all I'm saying is, uh, so this, this S, this S should also have the subscript I, okay. So I look at, so in order to construct the I plus, SI plus 1, I look at AI plus 1. If the addition of AI plus 1 still preserves the property, then I call that added, I add that AI plus 1 and call that set SI plus 1. Otherwise, SI plus 1 is the same as SI, right? So this is, so this, now, now what happens is since we are only adding elements, what you get is an infinite chain uh, starting from S. And this infinite chain is, uh, uh, is a monotonically increasing chain, yeah, uh, is, is at least monotonic. So no set is, no set is, uh, so SI is guaranteed to be a subset of SI plus 1. And, uh, and what I can do is I can take the union of this infinite chain and call that S infinity, yeah. So this union S infinity I claim is a maximally, is a maximal extension of S which will satisfy the property P given that S satisfies the property P. So uh, firstly S infinity should satisfy the property P, well this is because you take any, so if S, S infinity is an infinite, uh, is a possibly infinite set, so you know since P is a property of finite character it is enough to show that an arbitrary finite subset of S infinity also has the property P, right? So let's take any fi finite subset T of S infinity. Then one thing is because this is a, an increasing chain and this is this S infinity is a union, this P must be contained in some SI, yeah? And uh, since SI satisfies the property P, any subset of SI also satisfies the property P because P is a property of finite character. So therefore, T must also satisfy the property P. So therefore, then since P is a property of finite character, S infinity also satisfies the property P. Yeah? Okay. So, 
So, S infinity therefore satisfies the probability P. The next thing to show is that it is maximal, right. So, supposing supposing there is an element A that you can add to S infinity, right. Then, but this element A would be some A i in this enumeration A 1 to A 1, A 2, A 3, etcetera, which means if this S infinity union A, if S infinity union A satisfies this property and A is actually the ith element in this enumeration, then what it means is that S i plus 1 would just be S i union A i and S i plus 1 we know that satisfies this property P. And this S i plus 1, uh, you, this S i union A i plus 1 would actually be a subset of S infinity union A and P is a finite, uh, P is a property of finite character and if S i contains A i, it means S infinity also contains A, therefore S infinity does not get extended, right, okay. So, all that we are saying is, so therefore you take this, uh, so any property of finite character will actually can be extended to some maximal set such that the addition of any new element. So, the for any set S that satisfies the property P, it can be extended to a set S infinity such that the addition of any new element actually uh, negates the property. Yeah. Okay. So, so, what I am saying is, uh, so assume that S has the property P, yeah. Uh, assume S is a set which has a property P, you have an enumeration of this, of this uh, universe, it is a denumerable universe. you have this enumeration. Now, what I do is I start with S naught equal to S, okay. And what I do is I construct my S i plus 1. So, S i plus 1 equals S i union A i plus 1. If S i union A i plus 1 satisfies the property P. If S i union A i plus 1 does not satisfy the property P, then my S i plus 1 is the same as S i, fine, okay. So, I go through this construction through this entire enumeration. So, what do I have? I have S equals S naught and S naught is a subset of S 1. It may S 1 might contain A 1 or it might not contain, but it contains all the elements of S naught and so on and so forth. So, I have this infinite chain, okay. And now, my the S infinity that I am constructing is simply the union of all these S i's. Okay, where i is greater than or equal to 0, right. So, that is, so this is my construction and now what I am claiming are two things that this is a maximal extension of S. So, essentially what my claim is that this S infinity, S infinity is the maximal is a maximal extension of S that satisfies that has property P. Yeah, this is my claim. And this is the claim. So, I am going to prove it in two ways. Firstly, that first first thing of course, is that I have to show that. 
so the first part of the claim claim 1 is that s infinity has the property p okay keeping in mind that this p is a property of finite character what i'm what i need to show is to show that so the it suffices to show this subclaim that any finite subset non empty subset of s infinity any non empty finite subset t of s infinity has the property p okay so this is sufficient so the proof of this claim is all that is required right so i assume t is some finite subset okay now what i am claiming is that t is actually t since t is a finite subset it consists of the elements a1 a2 a3 a4 and so on and so forth assume so th therefore it has and it's a finite subset so it has an element with a maximum index for example right so which means that t is subset of some si okay where si belongs to this chain right okay so if t is a subset of this finite si and we know that si satisfies the property p therefore any any and p is a property of finite character therefore any subset of si satisfies this p therefore t also satisfies this p right so that is there ends this proof right the next claim so s infinity is of finite character so the next claim which is claim 2 is simply that s infinity is maximal right and uh, is maximal in the sense that uh, it is the uh, it, it cannot be you cannot add any more element and and still get a larger set which satisfies property p right so so the obviously the, the so the question is suppose s infinity union a satisfies property p so if s infinity union a satisfies property p then this a must be equal to some ai in the enumeration for some i greater than 0 so which means that since this is a property of finite character firstly this means that this implies that this a belongs to s i right because in the because s i was constructed from s i minus 1 by adding this element a if s i minus 1 union a i satisfies the property p. No, 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 P is a property of finite character. So, any, fi any finite subset will also satisfy the property P, right? Okay. So, that, so that, that, that is no problem with that. So, S i so so then so what what we are saying is that s infinity satisfies the, the property p so s s i minus 1 also satisfies the property p and uh, s infinity s i minus 1 union a i would have also satisfied the property which means that a was already in s infinity and therefore you have not extended s infinity any further yeah 
No. We are we are assuming that P is a property of finite character. And that means that it does not matter whether you take a finite set which has this property or an infinite set which has this property, every finite subset of it also has the property. Yeah. Right? Okay. But okay, I will go through a different form of this proof uh, maybe if I have the time. Yeah. So now, so you have a maximal set, max, a maximal extension. There could be many such maximal ex extensions. So in particular, if you, if I were to take, uh, if I were to take a set delta, I'll call it a set of pro propositions. Then I'll call it maximally consistent uh, if it is satisfiable and no proper superset of it is satisfiable. That means, if I add any more element to it, then it should not be possible for me to, uh, then what I get is unsatisfiability. I get an ins inconsistency by adding any new element to it, right. So, so, the, uh, the, so if I were to do that, it follows from the semantics of propositional logic that for if I were to have any maximally consistent set delta, for any formula phi, either phi or not phi would be a member of this delta. Because for any truth assignment which satisfies all the elements of delta, only one of phi or not phi can be false, both cannot be false. So, therefore, it should be possible to add one of them and still maintain consistency, still maintain satisfiability. So, there is a, tr so for every truth assignment in which uh, all the elements of delta are true, either phi is true or not phi is true. So, I can add one of them and still maintain consistency for that truth assignment. So, the fact that such a truth assignment exists is enough. Yeah. So, so this is one corollary of maximal consistency. And, uh, Lindenbaum's theorem is the next important theorem, which is essentially like a consequence of the fact that compactness is a property of finite character and therefore, any set of formulae can be extended to a maximally consistent set, right. So, Lindenbaum's theorem essentially says that every consistent set can be extended to a maximally consistent set and maximally consistent in the sense that you cannot add any more new propositions into that to that maximal set. So, you take any set gamma, there is a maximally consistent set gamma infinity, which is a superset of gamma. And uh, actually by Tukey's lemma, but we, uh, by the way, this, this thing here says that there is another proof also. I mean, so what we can do is we can completely forget about Tukey's lemma and do everything that is there in Tukey's lemma also in the proof of Lindenbaum's theorem, right. So, if you feel more comfortable, we will go through this proof, right. But essentially, if you were to take Tukey's lemma for granted and consider the fact that compactness is a property of finite character, then every set gamma, every consistent set gamma can be extended to a maximal consistent set gamma infinity. And, uh, but if you are if if you want to do the proof independently it is essentially like this. So, if, what we are saying is you just since P naught the set of all propositional formulae is finitely generated uh, from an infinite collection of atoms using the operators the standard boolean of uh, the propositional connectives. So, therefore, the resulting set P naught is a countably infinite set therefore, it is denumerable which means that all the formulae of P naught can be extended, uh, can be enumerated in some form phi naught, phi 1, phi 2, etcetera. I start with a consistent set gamma, okay. it is a consistent set. So, so now I mean it is we are not looking at, I mean so we are already looking at consistency as a property of uh, 
as the property of finite character. But now we can start with starting with a consistent set gamma, call that gamma naught. Just go through this enumeration and add all the formulae which in the enumeration and keep building gamma i, gamma i plus 1 and so on and so forth, so that you maintain consistency. So, you get this infinite chain of consistent sets. Okay. All I am saying is this union of an infinite chain of consistent sets is also consistent, that is that's, that's all we are claiming. Right? So, this gamma infinity is just this union of this chain of consistent sets and you can prove that gamma infinity is consistent because you take any, any, any finite subset delta of gamma infinity, then since delta is finite it must be a subset of some gamma i and uh, since gamma i is consistent delta is also consistent, hence every finite subset of gamma infinity is consistent. Since gamma i is consistent, every finite subset of gamma i is consistent, therefore delta must also be consistent. Okay. Uh, so, so, which means this delta was arbitrarily chosen. So, every for every possible finite subset of gamma infinity, it is true that, that every such delta will also be consistent. By compactness, it follows that gamma infinity itself is consistent. Right? And uh, the fact that you cannot add any more, you suppose that there is some formula phi such that gamma infinity union phi is consistent, then phi is some phi i for some i greater than, uh, greater than or equal to 0 in the enumeration. And uh, since gamma infinity union phi is consistent, again by compactness, uh, gamma i minus 1 union phi i is consistent which is a, because it is a subset of gamma infinity union phi i and but gamma i minus 1 union phi i is the same as gamma i and gamma i is consistent and therefore you have not added any new element right so it does not matter even if you don't follow tukey's uh, the proof of tukey's lemma it is possible to just work with compactness itself and in fact the original proof by lindenbaum actually was was this or something like this I do not think he had access to Tukey's uh, lemma, uh, he just thought it out that uh, a, an infinite union of uh, consistent sets would actually give a consistent set, but that requires proof for me. Um, right? uh, so, so, that is what uh, Lindenbaum's lemma is. By the way, uh, so I have, uh, uh, but uh, Okay, so there are uh, there are a whole lot of exercises for you to do, uh, which uh, when I when I put this up, you will be able to see. There are some interesting exercises which require uh, a fairly, I mean, requires a fair amount of thought. I mean, they are all purely set theoretic exercises, but they are not very easy. Okay, so please do those exercises. Uh, there is some there is a notion of uh, closure under logical consequence in particular uh, which is related to maximal consistency so this is an important uh, thing right so you uh, one of the things we we started out with the notion of arguments a validity of arguments the fact that you have uh, what we have are a, a set of hypotheses and you want to prove that some conclusion is a valid logical consequence of this set. Right? We transformed it into well tautologies and then contradictions and then we came into consistency. Now, the question is what is the relationship between consistency and logical validity or logical consequence. Okay? So, there is an interesting theorem by Tarski. So, what, what I can do is I can take this gamma okay, and I define gamma superscript this to be the set of all psi such that 
psi is a logical consequence of gamma. Yeah. So, this is I call this closure under logical consequence. Remember that if gamma is a consistent set actually it does not matter whether gamma is a consistent set or an inconsistent set gamma is always going to be a subset of its closure. So, this the other thing is that we looked at the notion of maximal consistency okay, and we said that each gamma can be extended to a maximal consistent set, but that does not mean that a maximal consistent extension of gamma is unique. There could be many different maximal consistent extensions of gamma. Okay. And in fact, there will be a countably infinite number of maximal extensions of gamma. Okay. And so, what we are saying now is, and what is this, this important theorem of Tarski's says that you take this, this if gamma is consistent then it has certain logical consequences. Consider all those logical consequences. In particular, every formula in gamma itself is a logical consequence of gamma. right? So, this is simply the intersection of all the maximal consistent extensions of gamma. And that is the relationship between mere consistency and logical consequence. Yeah. Right. So I would suggest that you spend some time uh, trying to prove this. It looks purely set theoretic, and it looks. Uh, but uh, the f the fact of the matter is that these, especially these things which. Uh, uh, these uh, these set theoretic uh, notions, which actually require countability and uncountability, one has to be a little careful with them. Uh, so, uh, but please do try this. It's an important theorem. This is what relates logical consequence with consistency. After doing all this stuff, it comes back as essentially a big intersection of all the maximally consistent extensions of gamma. So. So, every element which is there in every maximally consistent extension of gamma is a logical consequence of gamma. Okay. So, there are also some other interesting things. Um, uh, the other interesting thing that you need to show is uh, that for example, every maximally consistent set is also a Hentika set. So, that means it is closed under those Hentika closure operators. So, you can take all these kinds of closure operators and play around with these sets. Uh, lastly, what uh, I have is a very fairly complicated and hard problem for you to do, uh, which is that just like we can have, uh, we have interpolation in numerical analysis. Uh, interpolation in numerical analysis is intimately connected with the less than or equal to relation. right? You are essentially talking about uh, given a curve, given two points on the curve, uh, you are finding some point in between those two points on the curve, right. So, that uh, so if you look at if you look at this curve in uh, as uh, some if you if you just think of it as a uh, on the two dimensional plane, uh, what we are saying therefore is uh, you have this curve like this and you have to do an interpolation that means you let us say you are given some two points where uh, let us say x 1 y 1 and x 2 y 2. Your interpolant is some point one or more points x i y i which lie on the curve and many uh, many numerical algorithms actually. Um, try to do interpolation. Yeah? They actually try to find points 
uh, on the curve. Uh, and of course, these points need not be unique, the many different algorithms can give you different interpolants. So, this is an interpolant, if you can find this x i, okay. and underlying this entire exercise is the fact that your x 1 is less than your x 2. So, underlying all this is the fact that there is a less than or equal to ordering, uh, it happens to be a total order on the reals, but it is actually an ordering. There is absolutely no reason why one cannot generalize this notion of an interpolant to chains of a partial order. Right? So, if I have a partial order with uh, lots of, uh, so this is like a typical uh, Hasse diagram, right? where I have, I have various kinds of chains on this partial order. Yeah, supposing I have a partially ordered set and if I am given two elements x 1 and x 2 which lie on a chain, then how do I, how does one find a find an interpolant x i lying on the same chain, right. I mean so, so the notion of an interpolant can actually be generalized also to partial orders. And here what do we have? We do have a partial order. What is the partial order relation? Your logical implication is a partial order relation on, uh, on propositions, right. It is it's partially ordered because every, it is reflexive because every formula implies itself, logically implies itself. If phi implies psi and psi implies chi, then phi does imply chi. So, it is transitive and it if phi implies psi and psi implies chi, then phi and psi need not be the same formula, but they are logically equivalent. So, if I were to take, if I were to take my set P naught, and quotient it over logical equivalence. That means, I divide it up, divide it up into equivalence classes such that logically equivalent uh, uh, formulae all reside in the same block. Then what I do have is that my logical implication then is a partially ordered, is a partial ordering relation. Because then what happens is you are looking at equivalence classes. So, what you are saying is that if one equivalence class phi implies another equivalence class psi and psi also implies phi, then these two equivalence classes are the same, because then phi and psi are logically equivalent. So, your logical implication is a partial order on the equivalence classes of P naught. So, if I look at P naught, it is partially ordered by the cla equivalence classes of P naught are partially ordered by this implication relation. So, you can think of these chains as essentially chains of implications. Yeah. Right. The standard thing therefore, now that since implication is transitive also, the question is now can you go back and find an interpolant. Right. So, given two formulae phi and psi, can I find some interpolant and what this problem does is it actually gives a fairly complicated way of finding an interpolant and you have to prove that it is an interpolant. Okay, so, you can it is a funny way of defining an algorithm, but it is like an algorithm for finding an interpolant. And of course, interpolants need not be unique, right? 
every algorithm for any pair will give its own interpolant. It is just that it has to be an interpolant and that has to be proven. So, these are some, so I put some deliberately hard exercises, but, uh, but they have some intuition outside of logic also that therefore, it is important to know that yeah, such things exist. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, uh, next time I will start with the notion of a formal theory and then after we have done all that, I will get into first order logic. Yeah. Okay, I will stop here.